is sort of completely left out from a real kind of really good tactical perspective. And so um, I wanted to go much deeper and and do it with founders who you know had, had raised relatively recently. So you know, as we've seen over the past couple of years, whether you're raising two years ago, you know, today or last year or three months ago, like really kind of makes a difference um, in, in how quickly things can change and across industries. Um, so we've got three great founders here who um, have recently closed rounds. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on, on how they did it. And we're kind of going to go in, in chronological order from you know, <clears throat> idea to deciding to raise to the actual process to you know, how they got everybody over the finish line. But first, we'll just start off and we'll have everybody introduce themselves and uh, you know, who they are, what their company does, and, uh, and maybe what they were doing uh, right before they started the company. Uh, first and foremost, Charlie, thanks for having me. No so appreciate it. My name is Jeff Fernandez, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Dandy, and we are an analytics platform for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, I started in a, a company called, called Grovo prior in 2010 to about 2018, which, which is uh, what I was doing before that. Cool. Yeah. I'm Emma. I'm the co-founder of a company called DM. We're building a social search engine that gets better than more women talk. Um, prior to founding DM, I was very early away. Um, I led all of their um, partnerships and marketing for the first three years of the company. Uh, I'm Cam McCarthy. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Beanstalk. Uh, we help consumer brands capture first-party data and help them get into retail. Uh, before starting this company, I was a sales director for multiple TV brands. Uh, most recent was a uh, <coughs> company, so if you've ever seen Chocolate Thomas at your local store, I'm the person who works for that. Uh, and just make sure uh, everybody's projecting towards the, the back and the sides of the room, and also we have a live stream going too, so make sure you're nice and loud. Uh, and I'm super excited to have Cameron here in particular because we, this is like the third uh, attempt. It was like, yeah, I today think is the last COVID, one. I had maybe. a uh, now two month old. This okay. is the fourth day of the last one. So yeah. it's quite <laughs> dodging this. <laughs> It's, it's sort of a requirement if I fund you that you eventually have to show up to the first day. So finally, you can get out of that. Um, so uh, first of all, Jeff, I'll start with you. So you've gone through this before. Uh, you've gone through the fundraising process. Um, and the first question I'll, I'll ask is, um, having had investors before um, and, and knowing what that's like, how did that prior experience of having investors change how you thought about financing this company, who you went to? Like, what were some of your lessons learned from already having folks on your cap table? Yeah, so I, I, think, I think lessons learned, uh, it really, what I learned the last time informed this time only as far as nothing really changes. Find investors, I think, that believe in the team, uh, believe in the mission, <coughs> understand the market. Uh, and are really excited to, to, to get in the trenches with you. It, it's a long-term relationship. So I, I, think, I, I think I had a pretty good grip on that the first time, and I think it only flowed through the second time. Sounds like no red flag investors the first time around. Decent, decent group. Yeah, yeah good, all good people. Pre-seed was just like, there are people who will get this without us having to explain ourselves a hundred times, especially when you're building a product for more diverse audiences, a lot of the people you're pitching might just don't get the problem you're solving, and so that's already a, a definite um, thing that we, and I think we were just, we combated that problem better during our seed than we did the pre-seed. Gotcha. And Cameron, I'm going to switch up the question a little bit. So you had a round uh, a couple of years ago put together, uh, probably set to close, I'm going to guess like March 20th of yeah, not great. 2020. <laughs> uh, yes, we had a term sheet from Charlie in March 2020. Uh, we had like the round started to come together and obviously COVID hit. So we brought out like 150K just to stay alive and then we just break ground in honestly until September of last year. So kind of the same thing, like our first round was Techstars, then we did a bridge round, uh, then we decided to raise a seed round in summer of last year when Pondell still wasn't great timing and it's never kind of market very well. Um, but we like we went out with a really realistic um, kind of valuation and I think it allowed us to go out and raise uh, in a really good place where you know now we know we can't do a nice FR mark on that. But yeah, our our 
was just kind of like dredging brick paths into survival and just like taking realistic parts on all those types of notes. And then we just kind of took our medicine on the same ground and, and all those kind of things. And I want to ask you a little bit about how the business has changed. And so when you first went out, um, you had some decent revenue traction, but on a slightly different business than yeah. you have now. And I'd be curious as to, um, you know, in investor reception, um, I, I feel like there was initial interest because of your revenue, but then as investors dove into it and got some yes, business, right. yeah. it didn't really pan out. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, like all revenue is not the same. So like all revenue is much very like service oriented. And so it's like me basically going out and be like, hey, don't you work with me? And like I'll basically be a salesperson for you. And we had all these other groups of salespeople. It wasn't really a SaaS company. So honestly, since we've raised the seed round, we've, we've been taking out a lot of ad revenue and really just like focus on like the beautiful scalable SaaS company. Um, I think if I would have told them back in the time machine, I would have said, just don't give them. Like honestly, we would have had more sort of no revenue versus like 50k MRR for a VC round people are like, well this is not repeatable. It's like great job, you made a lifestyle business, but this is not like your scale anymore. So uh, I always say that you can it's the story built in FOMO, all those things are almost more important this early on than like the revenue component. And actually revenue can really hurt you uh, like we've seen uh, a lot of times. So a lot of us right now is just making sure that we have a good tell our series A story and key one next year. That revenue story is healthy with revenue where Modeled out, it's all repeatable, and there's no unhealthy revenue where there are no this is way too kind of service based because obviously we see the time and we've seen that. And I want to ask you guys like, where were you status wise when like the very first check came into the company, and, and how did you decide like now was the time for me to go out and, and start asking? Was it a function of like you thought the story was right, or was it sort of necessity? I mean, we'll go back this way. Uh, in terms of like where we were as founders. Yeah, the time. yeah. Well, yeah. just the company. Like, did, did you have a product? Like, yeah, when we first got into Techstars, which is our first company, we did have an MVP. It was terrible, um, but mm. it kind of worked. Um, and I, I don't know, probably because my background in marketing, I'm definitely very good at pitching a vision and a story and, and that sort of thing. And I know that that and generating FOMO and all of that sort of stuff. And so I think that's. I've been told since that's why we got in so early. But um, the for our seed round, it was very much like we had really impressive six months prior metrics in our beta. Um, we we sort of obviously give you a time scale from tech stars to our seed round was like eighteen months, um, and we definitely had a lot more. I do think that at our pre seed, we were almost similar to you, like the metrics we had, people used as excuses, being like, you need more, or this isn't good enough, or this isn't enough, and I'm like, well, I have something, like, surely that's fine. Um, sure, it's better than nothing. Well, right? surely, yeah, you'd think, but it actually wasn't better than nothing, weirdly, or it felt like it wasn't. Um, and, but when we got to seed stage, we did have a solid, like, six months of cohort data, and proved them, proven that we could, like, reach the cap that we wanted for our beta users, spending no money and all of that sort of stuff. So we did have a more compelling story. And it was, we went out um, in March of 2021 and we closed it in May, so. And did you? No, it's 2022, sorry, last year. Uh, <coughs> the choice to do an accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, was that just kind of opportunistic that Techstars sort of popped up or you thought like uh, the accelerator was the, the best way to kind of get into market? Could you talk a little bit about um, it was kind of a combination of the two. I had been told at the time Jenny Fielding was MD, and I had been told by everyone that I needed to meet Jenny, and I was like, okay, well, I need to meet Jenny then, and I'm very glad I do now. <laughs> no, Jenny, she's awesome. Um, but it was a combination of being like, okay, we haven't done this before. Um, both myself and my co-founder have always worked in startups, so we're definitely intimately familiar with how you get it from when I joined away, there were 10 employees. <coughs> when I left there were 300 like we've seen the inner workings but we've never raised money we've never done anything like this and so something like Techstars definitely felt more of like a confidence boost in that way like how you fundraise here are all the tips um I don't know everything in between that they teach you there but um it was also like 2020 and like no one was writing checks and Techstars was kind of the only option
shit and tell what to look about the time. Like we started talking. Was it a virtual class? Yeah, it was the first one. Um, and I met Jenny in March of 2020, which is when we had plans to go and raise an angel round. Um, and yeah, I'm really glad it worked out the way that it did. It was probably a little bit of work. Gotcha. Um, what did you have when you went out? The first chat. So our story's a little bit different. Um, I'll do like maybe 60 seconds and okay. back. Yeah, sure. Because uh, the inspiration for the company came uh, came in 2017, 2018 as we got started. Because at our last company, 2014, 2015, we had a couple of <coughs> employees. And we did this work in spreadsheets and export all the data from our HR systems, HR assets, you know, et cetera. Take it, put it into a big spreadsheet, then we pivot to the work. And we dive off the paradigm, or lack thereof. And we looked at things like what you'd expect, right? Compensation wage gaps and attrition rates and promotion rates. And, Different groups of people were being treated potentially differently. We'd step in. People felt that we did it. It was slow, it was hard, it was manual. So we said, let's go create a software that does this out of the box. A handful of us got together. We actually had six go founders, including me. Um, we got together and we said, let's let's do this slowly, right? Let, let, let's bootstrap. Let's build a software that customers love. And I mean, customers at the time, right? Let's, let's build something that people love. Um, and, and, and let's take our time, right? Because at that time, 2017, 2018, DI wasn't what it was then as compared to what it is now. You know, sadly, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and others brought a lot of attention to DEI. So we did this at that time. We said, let's, let's wait out the market. We think it needs to exist in the world. Um, let's go slowly. So really, the first check in the business came in the summer of 2018. Um, a handful of friends and family said, hey, let's, let us be a part of this thing. We're doing really fortunate to have these folks around. So kind of happy with all that. But we were bootstrap. We really didn't pay ourselves you know, any money or anything. Um, we used the, that capital to fund like the basic operations uh, of the business. And we always said to ourselves, you know, basically, hey, if we get to close to two dozen paying customers, and our MPS score is really, really strong, and we have a couple of brand name companies that folks in this room would know, at that point maybe we should consider an external institutional capital. And so that happened, uh, you know, the beginning of 2021, middle of 2021. Uh, every quarter, we did a game. We do our quarterly planning. We looked at each other. We said, "Is it time or is it not time?" And eventually, we said, "Well, yeah, it's probably time now." Um, so that led into our raising uh, an institutional seed financing led by Spring Bank with Courtney and uh, Ali Brook with uh, with Khan. Um, the, the 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 sad part for me was this all coincided raising our seed financing. Um, we decided to raise the seed in the summer of twenty one, which was when my mom was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And it happened kind of the same couple of months, so it was a uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a tough period. The um, uh, the initial round that you raised for five hundred. Did you have like a minimum check size from friends and family? What was the smallest check in that? Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, a couple of friends were like, "Yeah, like I'm like it's fine." The uh, uh, you know, it's interesting. We throw around friends and family term. And I feel like in some ways it, it acts as like a mental barrier where you're just like, oh, how, how do I raise friends and family around? Like, I don't have people in my life who are angel investors or, or what have you. But, um, you know, still $5,000 is not nothing. Um, and you, you do want to make sure you set it up in such a way where you don't want everybody who's put $5,000 in your company calling you up every every other day, wondering where their money is going to be, when you're IPOing, and all that sort of stuff. But like, there's probably more people that you know who could write a $5,000 check into something than people who hold themselves out as being angel investors, or who think of themselves as being angel investors. So yeah, I've seen lots of rounds put together. I mean, I've had limited partners of mine uh, co-invest with me in rounds uh, and do their first ever angel check into a company, putting 10, 15, you know, uh, small checks in. So some of those friends and family rounds can be, uh, you know, kind of fairly cobbled together. Um, tell me about the six co-founder situation. Are you guys like six equal co-founders? Like, is everybody full-time in the business? Uh, so, so, no, one wasn't full-time at first, so. You know, for that reason, uh, you know, on the cap table, no, we were not. Um, it was, you know, but we get we're six co-founders because we're all really different. Mm -hmm. We do different things. We've worked together before. Um, you know, 
so Elise James is a producer and co-founder, and, and she she knows DEI better than all of us, and, and has spent a lot of time working in the space, and was a, instrumental in making the introductions to the critical DEI practitioners that helped us understand what we needed to build. Um, you know, Mamdal Ramadan is our CTO, and you know he's he's a he's an incredible CTO, and Sarag Mukhtar is our co-founder and VP of Engineering. Sarag is incredible with people, and they those two work very well together. Um, Victor Person is our co-founder, and he leads product and design. Is you know he's the lead designer on Google Maps, and, and so uh, finally Ryan Shelf, he's our VP of Revenue and co-founder, and he, he drives everything on the go to market. So for us, it was we just wanted to do it that way. We wanted to work together, and um, you know in the same way that our culture is inclusive, we, we try to say, hey, you want to write a five thousand dollar check to be part of the fans? We'd love to have you. And you know, if you're there at the beginning, you should make it sure. That'll be my job to explain that. Right. Well, and actually, I think that's an interesting perspective. And I've seen that in a couple of companies where um, there are some situations where someone might call someone a founding employee, yeah. right? Uh, where just because somebody's a co founder doesn't necessarily mean they have 25 to 50% equity in the company. They could just be, you know, somebody who is like, look, this is everyone who was here at the beginning. That's right. That, that's meaningful to us, right? And, and I think it's something that, like, they'll always have that in their career. Right. You, you describe yourself as the 10th employee at a web, right? Yeah. Very early on. That, that, that matters a lot. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure that was helpful to your fundraising story. If you were early at a company and saw that things broke versus someone who you know, hadn't had that yeah. experience. Yeah, I don't actually remember the exact number, but. <laughs> Ten yeah. Ten it, 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 it was small, we were in an apartment in Novita, that's all I know. <laughs> if you're free office in a residential <laughs> apartment, yeah, you're pretty you're pretty early. Um, so let's talk about actually like picking a number and, and whether you uh, picked a round size versus like had the market tell you what the round size is. Like did you go out for a specific number and get that or well, our timing was weird, right? I mean I thought I thought we would maybe do a little bit more than we did. Um, but you know, we decided to raise the finance in summer of 21. Mm -hmm. And then put all the materials together. I was pretty encouraged by the macro. And then started having some conversations late November and December of 21. And I was like, oh goodness, I think, I think the macro is changing quite a bit pretty quickly. Uh, so you know, by the time we got to January, we decided to, to, to raise a more traditional <laughs> seed financing um, at $3 million to raise 3.7. Gotcha. So right. unfortunately, we oversubscribed. But it came back down. It, it was not going to be like a bigger round in that macro environment that we probably went Gotcha. Out. So there was a moment where you thought it would be bigger, you pulled it back, but then you were oversubscribed and, and Yeah, and which subscribe. worked out nicely. And for you, was that like a 24-month budget, or was it a particular like revenue milestone you are going to get to? Or was yeah, it? I think it's a confluence of those things, right? I think you, you think about well, just that's what people do for the size rounds. Uh, like, yeah, it's, it's partly that. And then I think you think like, hey, it's, it's 18 or 24 months on the April. Right of, of, of runway, right? So how much cash on hand and um, how much runway does that get us? Number one. Number two, as you think about the milestones that you'll need to achieve if you went the, the Series A story, um, what are the milestones that you'll need to achieve? There are probably three, four, five critical milestones if you're a SaaS business or a marketplace business. Whatever it might be, these are different KPIs and milestones, right? So make sure that your budget and your growth plan can achieve those ideally within 12 or 18 months. So you have six to nine, maybe 12 months to go out there and raise the next financing. And so it's never perfect, right? As soon as you lay all that out, you, you execute for three months and realize, you know, uh, goodness, I need to change that, right? That didn't work out exactly as I thought it would. But that's the scaffold. Gotcha. How did you get your, pick your number? Or did the department um, tell you a number? Uh, so we had uh, institutional investors in our pre seed as well. Um, and I work very closely with one of them in particular. And she basically was like helping advise us on to structure the round, how much we should be going after. Um, so a lot of it was like advice that we took from existing investors. Also just like acknowledging the macro environment, seed rounds are typically between like 2.5 and I don't know, honestly about seven at this point, which is bizarre. But um, 2.5 to 4.5 is kind of what I was being told. Um, and we also just looked at like, okay, well, who do we need to hire? Because we're a consumer tech company. Like most of our, I mean, literally all of our burn is our salaried workers, like we don't really have to pay for anything else. Um, and so it was like, okay, well, who do we need to hire? 
how long do we think until we're going to hit those key milestones? Um, and that, yeah, those kind of what I've just described around. Gotcha. What about your? Yeah, we went out to thinking that we're going to raise three, uh, and then our first ever uh, meeting of our lead, they were like the pre capital position, I'm sure you would raise three. Uh, so we set on two after they came in. I think like that's one aspect of honestly Jenny was, was really like we uh, we made it to like the finals in New York and we had a pretty intimate one time. So I was like, man, I'm like, and she had really good advice too, like when to raise try to raise a VC, we're like, okay, we're gonna raise five hundred thousand and then one time we're gonna five hundred thousand and she's making a million. So like we gotta kinda of find that sweet spot for us. Like we thought we were gonna raise like three, came back to two and then raised two point two and uh, I'd love to say that was like really tied directly to like the guys, but it was honestly just kinda of, like and then it was like, okay, now it's going to be 2.2 as where we can get the guys around that versus like, okay, like we need to get some other percent to get our numbers. It's kind of like, let's see where we get it and then let's, let's adjust. And now it's very much more of a process of like, okay, okay, like, we're fine. I'll make a comment on the $7 million seed round for that next that you brought in. You may see headlines of companies raising what appear to be very large rounds given their stage. Uh, and this is like totally inside VC baseball, but what sometimes happens is, you know, you go out and you raise a couple of rounds before you actually get to a seed. And, and often these like angel, friends and family, three seed, you know, whatever, uh, they come in on safes or convertible notes. And then when you actually do go out and raise an equity round, that round may be a two, three, four million dollar round but all of the other previous money that you came in converts into that round. So technically, from a legal perspective, it looks like a $6 million round because there's $6 million of people getting equity, but there's maybe only $3.5 million of cash coming into that round. You just had $2.5 million of safes that were raised three or four times over the period, which um, A, nobody announces because nobody really cares that you raised like a million and a half dollars in a safe after you just raised two last year and you were able to pick up a little more, right? But then you get the opportunity to announce this like, hey, we raised a $7 million seed and everybody's like, oh, these guys must be amazing. Like, they, you know, it, they raised one of the biggest seed rounds that, that we've seen and all that, but it's, it's just kind of an inside baseball thing. Very few seed rounds uh, that, that raise cash like that, or what they are actually sort of failed A rounds, if you, if you will. Like, the, you know, they go out for, you know, 10, 15, 20, and the market's like, mm, I don't know if you're ready for that, but you still have a reasonable cap table. Like, maybe let's put five or six into the, it that looks more like a pre, uh, a pre A round. So not everybody's raising $7 million seed rounds. Um, I need to go adjust my press release now. <laughs> I was going to say to add on that, I think there's a really deceiving trend of uh, companies coming out of incubators and they've been given basically like $40 million and it's like they raised $40 million in Series A and I'm like, yeah, but it came out of like an incubator that was always going to give them $40 million right. and it makes it, look, it makes it look to someone who doesn't know about incubators or venture studios and any of that sort of stuff as though they just like went out and miraculously raised with absolutely no metrics. Which they just didn't. Right, and that money might have bought two thirds of the company. Yeah, exactly. Or like the or like the CEO might literally own two percent of the business. Right, right. Did you not add the prior money no. in the press release? Oh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't catch that. You know, yeah. We didn't add it. Ah, so so. It's fine. No, you know. Um, let's talk about targeting. Like, who did you go after, and and and, and maybe even let's talk about numbers because you you took a lot of meetings. And yeah, I suck at ginger <laughs> <laughs> uh, But hey, you closed, right? Yeah. There, this is you know, a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Um, so let's talk about like just you know what your funnel looked like and and you know what you felt like got you to a meeting and then what what got people over the, the finish line. Yeah, I mean, so talking about Jenny again, she has a really good actually blog post about uh, like creating your funnel. So like we had about four hundred VCs on there. I, I pitched 115, we ended up with five or six people in the round that made it up, so like the lot of those. I think my biggest mistake was I didn't adjust the pitch, like I should have known after the 30th pitch, I thought this isn't working, I was getting a product demo versus a pitch, and like then when I started to adjust that, it was a lot better. Um, so I would just make sure that you're constantly iterating on that pitch and just seeing what works, and like don't be afraid like 
lessons about. And actually, it was going better when I just didn't show the product at all. I just broke out the promo and just been like, yeah, we just sell divisions and like all the print new promos so every year. Like, that's a lot better than like, let's get the people to the weeds and let them go. Um, but yeah, like going back to the original question, like we just we had a partner, um, like VCs that we thought were a good fit. Then we kind of found our LinkedIn, so then we found who the, like, <coughs> Referral? Referral would be, yeah. So uh, then we kind of created that and we reached out to everybody with a ton of these referrals. Obviously, TechStars was like a really nice boost for us because we had a huge network, but yeah, we, I was going to charge quite a bit for introductions and things like that, but everyone was happy to make them. And um, yeah, and, and honestly, our, the person that ended up being the lead was somebody we said no six months prior. So I think a lot of times it's like a no is usually just a no for now. Like, add them to your like investor updates and like that's something always religious with is like every month we send that out even if it's not great news and a lot of our people were no's that came back in after seeing kind of like how diligent we were and the growth and all of that and so it was, it was a long process. And one thing I'll add too is like you had a little bit of a product expansion and, and, and uh, a, a direction that you sort of wanted to take that you um, in, in our conversations you were always trying to figure out like hey you know some VCs are saying that like we're not getting enough dollars from our customers Right? And where are, where can we solve a more important problem for them to get more of their dollars? And so I, I felt like, and you can tell me differently, that, that when you focused on bigger budgets, yeah. uh, more critical data uh, for your companies, and potentially like en more enterprise opportunities, that's when the VC reaction started to change. Yeah, I think we, we, we honestly just like did a bunch of pilot programs and like brought in, like we're showing a willingness to pay, like hey, they're able to pay $3,000 a month versus the $99 a month we were charging it. Once we brought in those like five or six pilots, that's it, for like three months, like they're like, okay, we can go month off of that. Now, my board meeting on Wednesday was them saying, I can't go up to your pricing more, so it's still a problem, but like, you know, you deal with it like in the moment. But yeah, I, I, we just like really made sure that we like get that pricing up and ran it for three or four months, and then that was Again, like all revenue is not the same, and we were able to show that that was eventually going to be repeatable revenue and going more upstream. And we kept talking about we've got 400 customers, all this, and nobody cared because we just weren't charging them like a meaningful amount to them. Uh, so you just kind of got to figure out like what they actually care about, and a lot of times it's not what you really care about as a company. So you talked about tiers of investors, and, and I'd be curious about that. One thing I'll ask is like, could folks in the audience who like venture is kind of new to them and they don't necessarily like follow this like hey like what do you what do you mean um what tier am i at uh no um, <laughs> I can't <disclose> that information. <laughs> is there some secret list <laughs> like, there definitely is and i'm founded but so, <laughs> so so how does somebody figure out that tier and then like how did you play that chess right did you hold back the, the investors that were more on your your A list you, and get some practice in and, and you know uh, how do you sort of play that game and then how many did you wind up pitching in the process? Um, yeah, so for our seed, uh, building off of saying Jenny's blog post is amazing, you should read it. Um, how we built up our pipeline. Um, so tier one, we had tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one was really just like people who a we either like really want to work with and think have a really interesting thesis on our space or just like think we're really smart. Tier two was like people who like invest in like consumer technology or consumer social and again like have interesting people on their team and think we could work with. Tier three was people who were still like would invest in our thesis, but we did we thought we might need to like explain ourselves a little bit more to them so they wouldn't be like as easy of a pitch. Um, to, to get the business and the concept. Um, we started- So it's a little reputation based. You weren't necessarily saying like, these are bad VCs, these are good VCs. It was like, no. hey, we've read a bunch of stuff that this person said, we're pretty sure they're gonna get this. Yes, okay. yeah, so a lot of, but I know some people do it reputation based as well. <laughs> um, but, um, uh, and I think uh, that, that definitely plays into, I know a lot of people's pipeline process, but, um, then what we did, to your point also about like refining the pitch, uh, I started with tier three and some tier twos that I wanted to like get in the process. Um, I have a rule where I refine my pitch every eight pitches. Every single pitch I do, I write down what people ask, what 
they said, what the vibe was, um, and then based off of those conversations, after eight, you usually have quite a good amount of data, and you're like, okay, tweak this intro part, tweak this part of the story, add this data point sooner, like, or add something in that you hadn't been talked about, but everyone always asked you first, like, as soon as you stopped talking. Um, after those eight pitches, um, refine it, sometimes refine the depth, be like, okay, this language, people keep going, for us, it was like, they keep going for being a content business, and it's a search business, so uh, we were like, okay, change, like, change that, make it very obvious that it's a database, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so tweaking the pitch and then using that on uh, like our sort of tier one, tier twos more. Um, and that, for our seed round, I hope that this happened for our A, but our seed round, um, our lead committed in six days. And I think it was a lot because of that. Like it was a lot to do with like how much information I gave up front. Obviously we got on really well, but all of the preparation that we've done, um, not only in making the pipeline, but also in refining our pitch as we go. And honestly, like something that we haven't spoken about yet on the panel, FOMO is everything. Like learning the game of fundraising is like, I think, I'm not gonna speak for you, but like most VCs like will not say that FOMO impacts their decision making. It, it does. Um, and it makes a huge difference if you understand the levers and the back channeling and the recommendations you can get from other founders on your behalf, that does have a big impact in the speed of your round coming together. Um, and so I would say like FOMO and learn, literally just learning the game and like finding the game fun, um, <laughs> it makes a really big difference. I'll make two quick FOMO comments. One is in defense of VCs. Uh, I was saying it's bad. But no, it's no, 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 I'll, I'll give you a time where I totally participated in it. Um, but uh, one is, you know, we, we get a lot of stuff in the inbox. And, and there is a reality to how fast certain stuff is moving, right? And if you only have bandwidth to work on, like, one deal, and there's a reality of, like, this deal's going to go. And you just get that sense, right? You, you, you have to pay attention this week because it's just not going to be around next week, right? So there's a little bit of like, I feel like this is moving fast, and so I have to pay attention. Now, whether that makes somebody do it or, or more open to it or whatever, like, sure, I, there's no way that doesn't play into this, right? Um, I mean, I've definitely invested in things where I seem to be the only idiot who wants to invest in this company, and it, you kind of question, like, am I wrong here? Like, I, you know, no one else seems to want to do this. Um, so, so there's a reality to that. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story of, of when I was a principal at First Round. Um, we, I, I found uh, GroupMe out of the TechCrunch Disrupt Hackathon. And so I was like the first VC that they had met. And I, we were using like a really terrible demo. It was only on text messaging. You couldn't get yourself out of a GroupMe group. So I got all the First Round partners stuck in a GroupMe group right when they were like in the audience at TED and their phones were just like blasting with text messages and all that, it was a total disaster. And, and so pretty much it was like obvious that we like didn't want to do it. Um, so I, I sent it to a bunch of other people that we had said we wanted to work with. And I may have massaged over our level of interest in the company and said, yeah, we're really excited about this and sent it to like SB Angel and Betaworks and all that sort of stuff to the point where like they got on board and then I was able to come back to my fund and be like, hey, like all these guys are really interested in doing it and I like may have said that we were interested too. Um, and it just made the conversation internally <coughs> trying to get team attention on it different. And, and that's just like, you know, it's obviously no knock on, on, on you know, the partners in the fund, but yeah, it was like we were the first First, first one to find it, last last one in, I think. Um, and uh, you know, it, it 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 does make a make a difference. I'll, I'll say on the other side of it, the fake FOMO and the transparent FOMO that you know <coughs> somebody comes in and says, "Hey, this round is closing at the end of the month," and it's like, "Okay, but like no one's committed yet, so I don't know how you can say that." Uh, I can tell and, you personally. Yeah, <laughs> um, and especially like, how do you then come back to somebody two months later? And be like, just wanted to check in. I'm like, you just replied to an email that you said the round was closing in January, and so now you're just reminding me that you.
that I, I you've cried wolf on this this company, so you, you do need to be uh, careful about that. I think um, just to add on the FOMO piece, though, not just that type of FOMO, mm -hmm. but uh, which definitely doesn't work. But the uh, I mean, maybe sometimes mm -hmm. people are good at it. I'm sure Adam even could pull it off. But the um, pieces of FOMO around like your business as well. So if you're going through the fundraise process, it's something that I found really helpful to get like just a response or a second call or a third call on the books is be like, oh, FYI, since we spoke 10 days ago, our user base has grown X amount or like we just landed this press article or like something that has happened and you can like, I don't know, this is the marketer in me, you can make a story out of anything. Like any single good thing that has happened um, can be something that is worth like re reaching out and like nudging them on getting that second call or third call. Well, and I think it's also good to be a little bit intentional about releasing information about good yeah. things happening. Um, you know, I just had a company that uh, raised, they went out in like October, November. It seemed like it was going really slow, and then the round wound up being oversubscribed. And I asked the founder, I was like, well, we talked about this back in November. I was worried about this thing was going to close, and we were like a million dollars oversubscribed. But what happened? And there were just a bunch of things that, you know, like, they, they won some pitch contest, they uh, announced some partnership, and there were like three or four things over a period of like three weeks where it just it felt like to the outside world that something was happening at that company. Now, I don't know if they were necessarily intentional about it, but you can be intentional about PR releases and when you're trying to line stuff up. Yeah, I mean, you said that it became like the best fundraiser like in our tech stores class, like anytime somebody's like, uh, you know, to tell us about revenue, he'd be like, honestly, you might not be VC for us, you're, just, you're not buying this division, and he would just like end the call. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, works, he raised money in like no one's business, and still like, it's, and so like, if you, it's kind of like, you've got to be fearless though, like, I think like, you have to remove the safety net to build actual FOMO, and that's why it never worked for me, because I was like, way too transparent, and when I tried it, they're like, hmm, so it's like, <laughs> like, like you gotta just be fearless in it. If you don't, if you're not that mentality, it's just gonna come off wrong, and then you gotta stick through whatever work works for you. Yeah, information <coughs> and the way that you share information is basically your only power in the fundraising. And obviously, you have an amazing business; it's an excellent opportunity. But the, how you disseminate that information and when you choose to do so is like your power a lot of the time. And so. Just yeah. like be aware of that. Like if it means being like, sorry, I can't share a revenue because you just don't get the vision, like try it. <laughs> so, so what's your fundraising style? Um, it's a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a tendency probably to err on the other side, which is I am I, I produce way too much information. Uh, segmentation and sales cycle, my deal side. But I mean, I, I've worked in B2B SaaS businesses and they're KPI laden and, and heavy in that way. So I have a tendency to probably be way too dense. Um, the, you know, my, my approach is here's a really, I think, great presentation that talks about the business um, very deliberately. And to someone who, you know, who's really paying attention, it's very thoughtful. And, and so we can have a substantive conversation, ideally. And I, you know, Theoretically, that produces a relationship, and you want to spend more time on this, and theoretically, you know, probably more of this than with me. But like, you know, if you, you have fun with it that way, so like, that's my approach. And you probably get a cap table request back because that's probably what that's, the that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea, and especially in our business, right? I mean, with Dandy, thinking about targeting, our perspective is one where there are a couple of hurdles, right? First and foremost, right, you had to. Leave in DEI and want DEI to like to be a real thing. And, and in most folks, you know, we're of that variety for what it's worth. Um, you, you know, but but secondly, I think you really wanted you, you definitely get investors that really wanted to help create that outcome, right? Which is a little bit different. It's a little bit more leaned in and a little more forward. Um, thirdly, you'd have to have we had you realize we had to get folks who were comfortable with six co-founders, right? And the fact that none of us were like actually employed by the entity. Right, and we'd have to be, become employed instead of a PO. And there was going to be a handful of months of setting up a proper entity and company. You know, we had the C form and all that, right? But actually, Tom worked too. Um, so for us, the, the, the targeting there was 
little bit, a little bit different. Um, but yeah, my approach is very like, hey, here's all the information. I do you like to read and consume and you know, great. If not, then probably not going to call you back. Right. Uh, but I have, but my, my approach is more like, hey, if, if, if you want to chat with me, you're going to follow up. Otherwise, I don't follow up usually. Yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting. Uh, I definitely know that there are folks in my inbox who, you know, they have followed up, and you, you know, like, I I feel like maybe I should be. Um, well, they haven't actually necessarily asked. They're like looking for feedback. They, they poke around every now and then. And, and my reaction is sort of like, okay, clearly I'm not getting there on this, right? Clearly I'm not showing enthusiasm, the timing of how much I respond. And I'm kind of surprised they haven't cut me off earlier. And I wonder like either you're super efficient about the number of people that you can talk to, or you're definitely not time efficient at all. And you're like overspending your, your time with me. Uh, but I think that's really important too. As I work with the companies who are raising like next rounds, um, it, it really is a sales process. And um, I mean, I go back to like I was an investor in single platform when I was at First Round Capital, and I remember Wiley telling us about our uh, our their their best salesperson wasn't the person that had the highest close rate. It was the person who made the most calls and got no's off the phone quicker. So she just had a really good knack for like knowing when a conversation was not going to amount to a yes, and she was like done with you. So so her call volume was much higher than anybody else's, even though she had a lower close rate. Um, she just made so many more calls um, and just got so many more people in the funnel. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that was kind of our approach. Like we, I mean, I got a lot of no's because it's because we we cast a pretty wide net because we could pitch both the CBD investors and to, to the tech investors. So like I don't necessarily think we were like offline. It was just like this is our approach and, and it worked for us. But I think like we'll probably get more attention next time. I, I want to get one more question before I go to uh, to audience Q and A. Um, but and it, it's more about like uh, your dynamic with your investors now. Uh, you brought people on. Like, did you? Uh, bring on board members? Do you meet with, you know, uh, a certain group regularly? Like, what what's the interaction like? Uh, so for, we we did bring on a board member, Corey Leinkler from Springbank, and our interactions are such we we do a a set call every three weeks, thirty minutes. I prepare an agenda. It's not formal, but it's not informal either. It's like perfectly informal, <coughs> um, depending on topics. It can be very informal, right? Um, that's what touch base. It's like a one-on-one. -on -one. And then we do quarterly board meetings, which we just did one, uh, March 16th, Thursday, um, which is, of course, a more, more proper board meeting. Uh, and I send monthly investor updates on the first, which I take great pride in. Uh, the team knows on the first I'm paying bills and writing the update. Nice. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how it goes. Cool. And, and did people ask for that or you decided that, that was just an exercise that you wanted to do? I did it at our last company and um, I do I do it now. I, I just decided I like to do it. Folks do ask for it. They, you know, they, they consider, hey, what's Does everybody get it, even the $5,000 person? Absolutely. Cool. Everybody. <laughs> cool. Yeah. What about you? Um, after our pre-seed, we uh, a fund a crew invested and I had a call every three weeks with um, the girl that led that, uh, and that was really helpful. We talked about anything that I wanted to talk about <laughs> that she could help with. Uh, post closing our seed, we actually set up, we don't have a board, um, but we set up an informal board. So we three months quarterly uh, with our three biggest investors, uh, which is um, Acro Flybridge Installation, and that's really great to get them all in the same room. Um, with Stellation, I also usually talk to him probably like once a month-ish or text if I need anything in between. Um, I have pretty like, I would say like probably a casual relationship with a lot of our investors now, which I prefer if you ever picked up, I'm quite a casual uh, person. Um, and it just means that you can have more of a, you can truly build a relationship and, and um, ask for stuff more candidly perhaps as well. There's less of a performance or putting on a show uh, that, that can, I know, you can feel that way with which you bring on investors. Um, and so yeah, we do quarterly, we have our next one in three weeks time. 
Um, and then same, I do a monthly update for all of our investors, no matter how the size of your check, we also have advisors on that list. Um, and really I use that as an opportunity to like ask for help when we need it. Obviously we deliver all of our metrics and updates and everything that we've done as a business over the four weeks prior, but that's your real opportunity to like, hey, you guys like bought into this vision. I need these three things this month. Can you please help me get them? Um, and it works every time. So very helpful. Yeah, we have, uh, set up a board after we raised the seed, so it's myself uh, in the industry vet and then uh, Jeff over at the company and I did, so they were our lead for our last round. Um, I really enjoy like after the seed round, like having like the formality of everything, like board meeting, like we used to have like our meetings and I, I did not have like a formal like approach to it. You know, like build a deck about it and then like I'm now post seed, like I've really like, enjoyed almost feeling like, okay, the formality of it, like almost like growing up with the company, where it's like, again, I'm now beholden to everyone here. We've got other stakeholders that are really invested in it, but I'm also like very capital with like most of like our investors, like my last 20 like text messages, like everyone's like, yeah, I'm constantly in communication with, like I follow Charlie and Strabo, like we're like not like, like in communication casually, but we also like, I take those more meetings really seriously. And I found them like really cathartic, like and I really enjoy experience like postseason I kind of feel like okay now we're finally in startup mode versus the four years prior it's kind of like we're not beholden to anyone it's just the three of us building this company and there's there's no one else like responsible for it and that responsibility has led to like better results and like we're all on the same page and the pace has just picked up and so for us it's allowed us to kind of level up and I've really enjoyed that and then staying really frequent with our with our monthly updates as well just to keep everybody in the loop uh, what we're doing so at the end of the day it comes together much faster and has changed and I'll say from the investor side, you know, we, we like to talk, right? We, so if you don't structure the conversation in some way with metrics or needs or asks or whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll just fill the space. And I, I know in, in the meetings that I've had where, you know, they're, they're not structured in some way, uh, there have been times where, you know, we just start talking about stuff and I'll like derail the conversation. And then somewhere we'll come along and say, yeah, you know, the founder will say something like, um, yeah, well, obviously that's a concern, you know, with only like six weeks of cash left. And I was like, whoa, wait a second, hold on. Like that, that should have been the very first thing we started talking about. Like you need to set the context of like what's, what's important, like what's going on in the company, like, you know, the revenue target, like, uh, oh, wait, your co-founder quit? Like, no, no, that should be the beginning of the, the conversation. So it's really important that we know enough to be helpful, and without that information, we're just sort of you know, kind of flying blind. Uh, questions from the audience? Sure, go ahead. Um, yeah, so this is to all three of you. Um, first of all, congratulations on you know, being successful in your, in your businesses. Um, obviously, I know that you know getting into like tech startups isn't like what gave you success, um, but it certainly helps. So, for maybe some of the founders and lights, by the way, um, I'm in VC as well, and I run a startup accelerator. Um, but I wanted to just maybe open up the question for everyone. Um, what like sort of two pieces of advice could you give to a founder trying to raise or looking, you know, at getting to that next level, but maybe they didn't get into a tech startup sort of like. Um, it may be a reiteration of what you've already said, but just to kind of put it out there. Well, let's go with that one piece of advice. One piece, yeah. Two, two pieces for two six, pieces. three people is six things. Um, yeah, that's, one that's piece right. of advice for everyone. Um, I guess, like, for us, like, yes, the Techstars network probably was helpful, but we didn't actually raise money when we left Techstars. Um, we were still super early. Like, we were pre seed We were much earlier than most companies in the program. Um, and so for us, like I literally viewed Techstars as a learning opportunity and a marketing platform. Um, so going out to raise like our pre-seed and whatever, obviously it's like a good sign if you've had someone already commit or you've raised previous money, but really it's just about, um, like I cannot reiterate enough how important your pipeline is. And like the, my biggest piece of advice to anyone in fundraising is take your time. Like I spend weeks on our pipeline before we like start fundraising. Um, no, and like, because you are going to be exerting so much emotional energy while you're pitching, um, that you should not have to be wasting any of that on a person that does not care about your company from a thesis perspective.
Um, so yeah, I think I would say like this. So this, I, I think a lot of people might not value the time, like how much time they should put into building that. But that's helped us more than anything. And I think that you don't have to be in an accelerator to, to do that. And if it's not big enough, you can run through it really yeah, quickly, really quickly, and then you wind up with this staggered start yeah. stop. Right. And also, if you're trying to get people to help you, like something that also you'll discover if you look up this blog post we've referenced a few times, um, is um, share your pipeline with people that can help you to like introductions. So like we have, we build out the whole thing, check sizes, thesis, point of contact. Here are the seven people, or one person, or like very tenuous connection to this one link that we could go after and make it really helpful so you can go out to any single person and be like, hey, um, here's our pipeline. I've noticed that you know these three people. Um, could you introduce me? I'll send you a separate forwardable if so. Um, also, if you wouldn't mind taking a quick scan through the pipeline and seeing if there's anyone else in there that you, you happen We're to missing. know or that's missing. Um, and like the most annoying ask that I've realized as a founder since is if, hey, can you introduce me to an investor? And I'm like, who? Like, I don't know your business. I would love to be able to help you, but like help me help you. And so that's how I view the pipeline as well, is like getting people to help you and making it easy. What's your one thing? Um, my one piece of advice, I think, would be don't fundraise. <laughs> so, and I, I, it is pretty brutal. <laughs> well, you're going to have to do it eventually, right? If that's if it's a if it's a business that is meant to be venture back, right? And, and so you'll have to do it eventually. But but try your darndest to to you know not do it when you don't have to. And what I mean by that is if you haven't yet raised money, how can you you know do the next one, two, three months and focus on progress? Right, go get five more customers, right? Like make that the goal. Um, in my experience, when you know you're ready, where you're like actually you actually need to fundraise, it's not to get an office. It's it's not because you want you know to uh, go on the payroll or whatever it is. It's because you're like, hey, I really need to do these three things, and I need to be able to hire this or a salesperson because I have too many leads or <coughs> right whatever it is you'll know because if there's a sense of urgency there. And when you interact, in my experience, with the venture community, that to me is not, I would call it FOMO, but I would say like folks know that on the other, other side of the table. When you're coming with a sense of urgency and your enthusiasm, it's like, no, actually, we need to do A, B, C, D, E, because here's what's going on with the company, and it's going great. Right? You want to get on a train that's leaving the station. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can't fake that usually. At least I'm not very good at faking it, right? Um, I like, I'm not good at that. So that would be my advice. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have too much to add. I mean, honestly, like, we went into TechSource and, like, we needed cash, like, honestly, like, we were going to go out of business. Like, when we got the note from TechSource New York, I was like, okay, like, I was driving to Baltimore Bakery, I'm going to get a sack of sauna, we're going to close the business down. Like, and then we got into TechSource, <laughs> we got into TechSource Atlanta, like, literally the next day, because, like, he was on our final interview, and I was like, okay, great, like, and that cash, like, kept us in the business. Um, like, I would maybe, like, if you're, if you're doing it with, like, unilaterally with, like, a full-time job, maybe just like de risk as much as possible and like make sure you're staying with that job until you fully de risk and you're like, okay, now this is venture back full. I feel like really confident in six months we can raise if I'm taking, if I'm working on the band and doing this full time. Or see if there's a pathway that's a profitability just for yourself and your co-founder, right? And, and like work it that way. Uh, like I said, you know, I'm sure the bad revenue part of it, but like when we raised with Charlie, we were at 50 MRR, I feel like it was it wasn't good anymore, but it was it was enough because we only had that 125k and from TechStars was winding down and let us continue. And then we like not like many like startups during COVID, we were able to survive because we had that revenue. And even though his revenue that we got rid of eventually after COVID, it allowed us to just kind of survive through that period and take on 150k, which is not a ton, and, and still kind of like iterate slowly on the product. So <coughs> it's just de-risking it and, and just kind of making it on your own time when it works for you and realizing like. You're not beholden to anybody else, even though it might seem like other companies are moving faster. Yeah, most people don't have the luxury of not raising time. We'll go one, two, three, four, five. Uh, what's your founders look for in investors? Um, besides the check that clears. Besides, <laughs> besides a wire. Um, the, uh, something I valued most in our lead from our last round was there's a book that we give to all of our new employees called Invisible Women. Um, and basically, if you read the book and don't believe the DM shouldn't, or shouldn't, shouldn't exist, then 
I don't know what you've just read. Um, and so um, I said that this was like to read this if you wanted to like truly understand the vision. Um, and he went away and read it and then talked to me all about it. And that was like a real sign of, uh, I think, like, I don't know, it felt very respectful of what we were doing. And so I really valued this. Um, I think, yeah, just people who also that you genu genuinely get along with as well, or that you want to learn from in some way, uh, you do end up talking to them a lot. Like I talk to our investors probably like once a week, at least if, even if it's just a text. So relationship, I mean, sometimes you just do need the money as well, but like the big investors try and get someone you really like. I think the best list that I ever heard, um, I, I had invested in a company that like took off right away. Obviously they don't all do that. And I, I really thought, it was like relatively early in my career, and I really thought that uh, this would be the kind of deal that, oh, maybe we can get like Sequoia to do the Series A, and that would be good for my own like relatively new track record. And, and another firm came in and sort of jumped into the process, which was not a like top tier uh, firm, you know? And I found myself at a little bit of a crossroads. Like I obviously wanted the founder to get funding, but I like didn't necessarily want them to take it from this VC, and so I, I uh, went back to uh, Josh Koppelman from First Round, who I used to work for, and, and Josh had, listen, there's like there's like four things basically. It's like, you know, do no harm, right? So obviously, like, don't take an investor that you think will like add negative value to the company. Um, can you get along with them in a in a board meeting? Like, do you actually like the interaction with them, right? Uh, do they hit your bogey in terms of pricing? Like they're not trying to like steal half the company or something like that, right? They, they're, they're dealing with you fairly in terms of what they're asking for. Um, and are they quick to close? Uh, you know, because a lot of folks will really draw out the process or uh, overly negotiate the legals or whatever. And he's like, to be honest, he's like, the entrepreneurs create most of the value in the company. So if you can just, you know, have somebody check off those four very simple things, like just close and move on. Um, which was kind of funny from a firm that like is all about building a great brand and, and all of that sort of stuff. And they're like, yeah, you, you, you take off these four things and just close with them. So um, maybe it doesn't have to be that bad. Although that list probably eliminates a lot of VCs. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, somebody was in the middle here. Yeah, we have uh, Thanks very much. Thanks everyone, really useful. Um, I was interested in what Cameron said earlier about you started. It's, I think we've got a business, Swagger Sales, that started as a service business. Yeah. And we were quite successful and we built software. Now we've got ARR, yeah. not 200K a year from two companies. But it's, I think it's going to be confusing for the VCs because we're not traditional with, because we started service and we've bootstrapped off service revenue. How would you advise me to talk to VCs about that? Yeah, I'll just change the timeline. Start the company when you went into that that phase of, of repeatable mm. like revenue. Right. We're not talking about at the A, or, like we're talking right now during our board meeting. Like, like when I go tell the story about the A, the company started September 2022. Like I'm not even talking mm. about anything that happened before that because that was just us finding ourselves. Oh, that's like that was the teenage phase of our business. So like we're really just like focused mm. on like this is when we started. This is the only thing you should care about, and we've been growing that business paid guys from that point. So I would just like, pretend like it never happened and. If they ask for it, great, like it's in your data room and that's they're not hiding anything, but mm. when you're crafting your deck and your narrative, start it when you want to tell the story. It right. does sometimes make pricing difficult because you're sitting here like, we're a three million dollar a year business, we should get credit for that. And mm. as an investor, I'm like, yeah, but I'm not investing in that business. Yeah. I only care about the business you're building and you. Yeah. Right. And like, yes, having that fundraising, one of the things that I thought about Cameron's business was like yeah, even if that part goes away, we could skip some fundraising because there's this part of the business that's sort of thrown off cash and mm. that de-risks it a little bit. So that was part of my calculation, but I, I didn't bid up the price because mm. of that revenue necessarily. And, yeah. and that's where I've seen a lot of businesses that start off more like agencies or, or anything else like that um, really struggle. And, and sometimes it's a struggle with like existing partners who are like, taking you know a uh, revenue share and and sometimes the best thing to do is actually just like do it as a spin it out uh, spin it out right mm -hmm. you basically say hey listen like 
business service business, like maybe my you know partner is going to run that and who knows mm -hmm. where it's going to go, it's going to run off, but like this is a new thing and it's capitalized to new and, and yeah. you know, here's how we're going to do that. That's good because that's just what we did. Okay, cool. You could story tell it a little bit and be like, we have this to make amazing business, it was very profitable, what business are we going to build with this amazing business? We very profitable. While building this business, we recognize this even larger opportunity. Mm, that's exactly it. what it was. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't, wanna, I don't feel like comfortable hiding it, but I, I, it's very interesting with the three answers. Thank you very much. Cool. No, somebody was over here. Okay. Yeah. Sure, sorry. <laughs> uh, for Cameron, um, quick question on the pilot. So uh, you started doing pilots with companies and yeah. then that got the interest of investors. Yeah. Could you tell us more about that story? What did that there were other customers that we were charging nine ninety nine dollars a month from and the biggest issue was like, okay, like are you gonna ever be able to increase that net dollar retention from your core customers? So like we went to them pitching in different products, we basically like built it out inside of Power BI, not even inside of like our existing dashboard and we charged them two thousand dollars a month and we showed the willingness to pay there and then we kept going up for three to four months and then we took that story and that's what we sold to the investors and we said okay we're gonna build this we're gonna and then the first thing the board was like okay that revenue is now going by like we're getting rid of it and we're gonna now build it in a repeatable process inside of our product but during that pilot phase we basically showed like okay we're we're gonna be able to iterate on this and put this part of business. I think the ability to test and get data very fast is very valuable for companies, right? It's like, if you're stuck in that middle price range, like, yeah. is there anything that you could offer them that they would pay thousands of dollars a month, even if it means like manual analysis on your part or, or whatever that, you know, sort of person behind the curtain type stuff. And I just had a company that I gave the opposite advice to. I was like, hey, um, closing has been very slow so we are not even getting to the point where people are using what we have. Can we just give it to them? Like how, how you know, when we wound up doing like a credits system where, you know, credits cost a certain amount, but we'll give you the first three months worth of credits and then hopefully get them hooked. And they, they know how much credits cost and, and you know, but uh, we're basically fronting them. And the founder actually just texted me on the way in and like they already have like, they, they went from like one customer signed in the last four months to now they have five people using it in the last week because they just got rid of the entire budget sales process and there's people willing to, to, to use it. Now, obviously they got to close them, but the, the bet is that like, if they integrate this into their process, they're not gonna get rid of it. It's just gonna save them a bunch of time. So, uh, but being able to turn on the dime and, and, and you know, from one week to another, like totally change the pricing or offer a different product is very helpful early on. Yeah, I think as long as you just have KPIs like tie back to it, and then like we were doing like three months later, like we did a premium at the same time. We were signed up like 80 brands a, a month. We're like, this is great, but then very few were converting. Mm -hmm. And then when we got rid of that, we were signing on 30 brands paid, and we're like, okay, this conversion wasn't there with the premium. So you just gotta like test it all out. Okay. I have a sales question. Uh, with respect to close of VP pitches, so specifically, you are talking to the right people, they seem interesting, you know, nobody's coming in, because like, first one somebody comes, you can go back and say, I have an offer, yada, yada, yada. Um, what are some of the tactics uh, that you've helped, which are not written on blogs and stuff that you discover during your process, which help you closing? That's generally for the panel, and specifically, Emma, and I can follow this on ebook, like, is like, is, you were talking about information release, and it's good to have talked more about like you know things you found out during your process. Oh, if I say this, that helps you know push the needle because it is very annoying to get to that stage and be like, all right, there you know there's a hotter startup out there, and you have to get hot, right? So th that technical is not hot enough. Okay, how do I get hot? And, and maybe let's get your two perspectives, and I'd like to hear the 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 chess master perspective, and then you like. B2B closer sales process perspective. Well, I don't think I'm a chess master quite yet, but maybe that next round. <laughs> um, the, uh, something that um, I was actually talked about in Techstars, but I think it's probably like more common knowledge now. And it's when you're in a pitch, a few, like, maybe like second, third call, something like that, like directly ask, um, basically like what would it take for you, I, this is not the exact wording, but like, what would it take for you to say yes? So sort of then what would it take for you to 
write your million dollars that you said that was your average check size kind of thing. Um, and usually, if they haven't been bluffing their whole way to that third call, they do have one, two things that they're like, uh, we need you to have, I'm making this up, we need you to have like, closed three paying customers uh, before we can write this check, or we need you to have reached 10,000 users or something like that. They'll, give, they'll say they're clear things. You're then like, okay, um, I can get back to you. Like, you can then go away and be like, can I do those two things in the next week? Um, <laughs> and then you can go back and be like, I know you said these things. Uh, we've now done both of them. Can I count on your like commitment? And like some other time, they'll still know, but you just like get to the point that they're very clearly things that are blocking them, or maybe there's nothing that's blocking them, and they just need you to ask. Um, and that def definitely helps speed it up a little bit. Um, I think there was a second part to the question: the information release. Yeah, what, what were the information levers that you figured out? Like, so just what I've heard for the group is like, one of my friends orchestrated their press release the week they were doing fundraising. Yeah. Right, and they were like. Strong in product hunt, like blog posts and everything. And this is something I've not done before. Next time I'm raising, I'm definitely going to do that. So you're hearing about the company from all different places. So, yeah. what were the information takers that you found were the most effective for an entrepreneur to like spend their time uh, doing? That? I definitely think that stuff like that does help. Um, Anything but better than nothing. I mean, most people yeah, do anything. nothing. They yeah. just like just heads do down throughout the whole <laughs> yeah. fundraising process. So if you can do any of those things, I think that is helpful. Something we did during our last raise, which I don't want to do again because it was so stressful, but we um, we released a feat like a feature that we knew would like help with uh, retention and engagement and like downloads. Like like I think it was like or like within the first few pitches so that basically our metrics just got better the more we pitched. You had an in the pocket for it. Yeah. Uh, but it can be less than that. It doesn't have to be as involved. It can be literally anything. Marketing one. Any closing tactics that got people over? Totally. Um, my experience is, is such that fundraising and selling are two entirely different things. When you're selling, Half of what we're trying to do is ask for the deal. We want to get it to a place where say, let's do this. That's not the case with fundraising. What, what's really similar, I think, is you want to identify the process, right? To your points before. What, what is the process? Every fund is potentially a little bit different. They're probably 80% the same, but they kind of have to be a little bit different. And partners you need to meet, and however their process looks, right? So first, understand that. Um, from there, they're choosing you, is my experience. They're the, they're the ones who are dictating this. Unless you are so hot, which is usually pretty rare. In fact, it's, it's pretty rare. So my experience is I'm not selling. I'm simply saying I am I am the product here and you're the buyer. Are you buying me? And so like I'm not really selling. It's more like, hey, here's what it is. If you like it, you're gonna call me back. This is your process, wonderful, right? You're going to go to your partner meeting, you're going to run it by IC, the investment committee, and like, either you're going to get back to me or you're not. And if you don't, guess what? That's a no. Right? Um, and if you do, and you can do so very quickly, like same day, right after the meeting, right? So the meeting's at 2 o'clock Eastern, right? You should wrap, wrap up by 4. Sure. If I get you at 4 or 2, guess what? That person is excited about the deal. If you get the email the next day, that person is less excited about the deal, usually. Again, it's not a perfect correlation, but it's pretty highly correlated, right? It's a people business. Charlie's a person, right? So if he's excited about something, that's the first thing he's going to do right after the meeting. So that's my experience of it. Like, you're not selling really. You're being chosen. Um, know what the process looks like to be chosen. Um, can I just quickly add one yes. caveat for women in the audience? Unfortunately, you do need to sell a little bit more. In my experience, like I, um, it is harder. Um, there is, I mean, you can see it in the data, you can see it in how you have to present yourself. Um, you really do have to pitch your, yourself more than, I don't know, my boyfriend also is a tech founder. I listen to him pitch, it's completely different. Um, and I just think, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I would hate for someone to go into the process and be like, no, I'm not going to email them. <laughs> Please email them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll. 
pitches I've gotten are very different uh, across genders. Not every single one, but generally. About 40% of the teams that I've backed have female founders. I find that um, a disproportionate number of the uh, underrepresented founders that I've backed spend more time essentially on trying to convince me that they should be in the room. Um, which, look, we get to, there's we get a whole discussion about whether that's necessary or not. But if you don't leave enough time to describe why this is going to return my fund, I'm never going to get there on it. Right? So it, it is hard because now you can say, well, I, I need to do both. But I, I, I feel like so many of, I feel like what really gets people excited ultimately is where this is going. Is this going to return my funds? Can you get to a $100 million business, right? People interpret who can do that very differently, but if you never ever say that, uh, it's gonna be really hard. And, and I can't think of any straight white dude who's ever pitched me who like didn't put the seven year revenue chart in there that eventually gets it up to $100 million, who didn't you know, at least ask for a million dollars. Like, it's, uh, you know, and it is really interesting just to see that, like, you know, the female founder comes in and only puts like three years worth of data. And I ask, and she's like, well, how far realistically in the future could anyone predict? I'm like, not very realistically, but you just need to put it there and say, yeah, I plan on taking this to $100 million business. It's not a promise. Uh, but there's an intentionality there that, like, because most of the people that you're going to be pitching look like me, that's what they're asking for, right? And if you don't play that person across the table, um, and you're just like, no, I'm awesome, and here's my team, and we're awesome, and all this stuff, like, they're going to be likely lapsing into this, like, well, I guess they're not trying to build a big business. They didn't put the big hockey stick chart on there. And so, I mean, you're not dealing with the brightest people on the other side of the table, let's be honest. <laughs> so, um, anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think oh. it's also, um, yeah, just if you think you're being arrogant, you're not being arrogant enough, is basically yeah. what I've realized. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's one, one question in the back, and then we'll. Uh, there's one last question, and someone had raised their hand. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, question for Emma. Um, I was kind of just curious about, uh, I think you're at one um, and your other co-founder is also a company? No, she's technical. Product, yeah. She's on product? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, that is something we get asked more than you could imagine. Um, but, uh, yeah, we do have, we do have her. But she, she carries comes all our bases. <laughs> I, I think uh, there's a big difference between having a technical person on the team or not, and whether that person is your co-founder. And I, I find that if you have a capable, uh, it depends on the product you try and build. Obviously, there are some products that just like don't really require it. I mean, there's people who build e-commerce companies that like, you know, you spin up a Shopify site and you get going, and like it, it isn't really necessary to at least at the start have that person. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily have to make the first full-time technical person on the team your co-founder if you don't think. You know, and, and as we said at the beginning, like making them your co-founder can be great from a title perspective. It can be very helpful to make them feel included in the team, but it also doesn't necessarily mean they have to have 50% equity in the company either. So those are three different things. It's like, do you have a person? What do you title them? And then how much equity ownership are like all three different things. Um, I want to thank everybody for making the time to come out and share their stories. Really, really appreciate it. And for everyone being here, have a awesome. Um, we'll see you in a couple of months, and hopefully by the next time we do this, you'll all have a round of praise. Good to see you, Charlie. Good to see you.